Hush now. Hush now, little one. Well, hello, friend. It's good to see you. I was born so many years ago in the city of Ur. My parents named me Sarai and we were quite a well-to-do family. I had brothers and sisters because my father had more than one companion. <laughs> That's how it is in the culture. And we had a good lifestyle. I have led both a life of privilege and of pain. But overall, there's been a lot of goodness. Things were quite easy in the city of Ur. We had many gods, many gods. We were a polytheist people. Our main god was the god of the moon. Mm. Once a year, sacrifices had to be made. I didn't think anything of it then. Where a virgin girl would be chosen to sacrifice herself for the people so that we would have good crops and maintain our easy lifestyle. It was always a great honour to be chosen. The families were always thrilled to think that they were noble enough and that their child was pure enough to be given to the God of the Moon, Sin or Nana, as that God was known. It was normal. A few of my friends left to fulfill their purpose. And then one day, the priest came to speak to my father. Oh, he was thrilled, he was honoured. But my mother was reluctant. And so my half-brother approached my father, his name Abraham, and he offered to marry me. Now this worked in my father's favour because it would strengthen our genetic purity and keep our wealth within our family. And so my father approved and I was spared the sacrifice. I assume that someone else would have been chosen in my place. As I grew up, I began to think this wasn't right. Sometimes I would hear mothers grieve. And sometimes I would see a, a young girl being taken up to the place of sacrifice by the priest. I had heard rumours that the priests perhaps did things to prepare the child for the afterlife with the God of the Moon in ways that a child shouldn't really know. This didn't seem right. It began to seem to me that our gods demanded, always wanting sacrifice. They always wanted an offering of this and that and then the ultimate sacrifice of a human life, so young and pure, just to give us protection, just to give us a peaceful life. It didn't seem right. I'd heard that there were 
nations that practice monotheism. They worship one God. And this intrigued me. I, I learned as I grew older that I just did not like the demands that were being made by our gods. Those man-made images where the priests lived lives of debauchery. They did whatever they wanted. It seemed they were above any law. And the people simply had to obey and hand their children over to the god of the moon and any other god that demanded a sacrifice. I married Abraham and he has been a good husband. This was so long ago. And we lived well in the city of Ur. We accumulated wealth. We accumulated respect of our people. We were a noble family. Abraham, a prince among his people. Then one day, something peculiar happened. One God, one God spoke to him. One God. It was the true God. And he spoke to my Abraham. And he told him to leave, leave earth. <sighs> the thought was terrifying. <laughs> to leave everything we had known, all the comforts. And he said he would lead him somewhere else. He said to look up at the sky, at all the stars that were without number, and that he would give him descendants that would outnumber the stars if he would just obey. Leave Ur, leave the comfort leave the easy life, leave the sin. There was a lot of temptation, a lot of things in Ur that we were not proud of. So he told Abraham to leave that life. When Abraham told me, I didn't know what to think, but he's my husband and where he goes, I go. And so, all right. And so we left. We had a lot of wealth and we packed up and we started our journey. We lived, we still live a nomadic life. God changed our names. He called him Abraham because Abraham was to become the father of many nations. <gasps> Unthinkable. That would mean I would have a child. We'd been married for some years and no child. And time passed. No child. We had, um, we had some visitors. And they came and they told Abraham that I would have a son. <laughs> Look, I'm not a young woman. <laughs> but first, let me tell you about some of our travels. I have been the object of affection of many noble men. When we have traveled, my husband has told me to say that I am only his sister. That's the truth. <laughs> I am his half-sister. He worried that leaders, great leaders, would have him killed in order to gain me as one of their wives. And so I did. 
as Abraham asked, because I love him and I want to protect him. So we came to Egypt with all our finery. <laughs> we gathered many wonderful things, many beautiful fabrics. Spun with gold. <laughs> Jewels. Fine clothing. Servants. Of course we would attract attention. So Pharaoh himself called me to come to him. And so I told Pharaoh that Abraham was my brother. You might be able to fool a Pharaoh, but you cannot fool the one true God who told Pharaoh that I was another man's wife. <laughs> Pharaoh was afraid. And so he sent us on our way. He didn't harm us. In fact, I've collected many fine things from our travels. Pharaoh wasn't the only king. And so they give me gold and jewels. The Egyptians are very fond of turquoise. Of course, of course I enjoy jewels. <laughs> what woman doesn't of any age? It surprises me that Pharaoh wanted to pay me any attention. <laughs> As I'm not a young woman, I wasn't then. And I'm certainly not getting younger now. You know, these rings and these jewels, they're lovely, of course. But my favorite ring is the simple ring that my husband gave me many, many years ago. During our stay in Egypt, I met someone, a young woman, called Hagar. Pharaoh allowed us to bring her along and she became my servant. Very loyal in the beginning. Hmm, in the beginning. But things changed. I mentioned our visitors. I overheard them speaking to Abraham. <laughs> now, I am a woman of age. My monthly impurity has long since passed. And they told Abraham that I would bear him a son. how I hid and laughed and I laughed so hard I tried to stifle it but they heard me <laughs> they told me that he'd be called Isaac <laughs> laughing one <laughs> I found it very very difficult to believe
99 years old. <laughs> Unbelievable. Because in the meantime, I grew impatient. I'd been barren for so many years and I had not given my husband a son and it grieved me. It gave me so much pain. And so I gave Hagar to Abraham. He was reluctant, but I told him, I begged him, this will give you the son that will make you father of many nations. And so he lay with Hagar and she bore him a son. Oh, we were overjoyed. But then things changed between Hagar and myself. She was not so willing to serve. In fact, the roles almost seemed to reverse. She would rub it in that I could not have a child and, oh, broke my heart seeing her son, seeing her holding her boy, knowing it was also my husband's child. And he was called Ishmael. Ishmael's growing a little older. He's a very active boy. And he has been developing an attitude of mockery, much like his mother. His mother never fails to point out my age. God had made a promise, <laughs> a very humorous promise in my opinion at the time. Interesting thing about our one true God, he makes promises and he gives. All those other gods in Ur, they made no promises. They threatened. We were afraid of them. When we came to worship our gods in Ur, those man-made images, we were afraid. And the very best we could ever hope for was relief that they didn't destroy us. It was like they were running a prote protection racket. <laughs> Give us this and we won't kill you. What kind of a God is that? <laughs> and yet, the God we now serve, he makes promises and he gives to us. And when he calls us to worship, he doesn't drain us, he doesn't, he doesn't take from us. He gives. When we are lost in worshipping our God, our one true God, and we look to him, and we fear him with reverence, not terror. He gives us a joy to have been able to endure all the discomfort of being in this nomadic lifestyle and to even find joy in my barren years. And yes, to find joy in my laughter at his promises. <laughs> God understood. And yet he still kept his promise. <laughs> you should have seen Hagar's face. Come little one, come. He's stirring. Let's see if we can get him back to sleep. Hagar is not happy. 
we've had a few conversations but I am ecstatic so perfect So perfect little one. And he has all his fingers and toes. Oh, such a tiny, tiny hand. Oh, my little boy. My little laughing boy. Look at his little feet. I've learned that God keeps his promises even if his promises are impossible. I'm in my 90s <laughs> and I'm a mother, a first-time mother. Such unimaginable joy. Even the impossible is possible with God. And he has taught us to have patience. I tried to make my own plans to fulfill God's promises. How much easier my life would be if I had waited not had to share my husband's affection with my servant. <laughs> my servant who is now full of mockery. Mm. <laughs> Our God is the one true God. Our God gives. Mm. When we make sacrifice to him, he returns it to us tenfold greater than tenfold. <laughs> All those years, decades of being barren, it was so worth it. Oh, little laughing boy, my sweet Isaac, you have a tremendous future in front of you. I may not live to see you grow up, but I will always know that you are part of God's plan. <laughs> One day you'll grow to be a man. <laughs> this cute little button bones, <laughs> those little tiny toes. Where will they walk? Hush now, baby. Sleep now. Sleep now. Good night. Good night.